Hello my friends, this is Roger once again. I want to tell you this is the most important thing about being on Facebook and so forth and being amongst a huge group of people. I get these things right away, people. I make a post and boom, I get a bunch of information. Jolene sent me this about a new pill that they've just designed at Tufts. And it's a 3D printed pill that can go through your gut and tell you what exists in what locations. And they can just stop it wherever they want with a magnet. And it scrubs up against the brush borders. It collects extremely well. And they know where these things are and where, where the populations are and how much there is of them. We need to get a database out of this. So thank you, Jolene. And here we go. All right, I'm just going to let this play. This guy is fascinating. All right, here goes. Formed 10,000 surgeries and holds the record for longest survival of a pig to baboon heart transplant. And what I want to know is how do you, somebody who eats a primarily plant-based diet, how did you come to the conclusion that there are some plants that are okay and some that are actually outright bad for us? Well, it actually all started with a major at Yale University as an undergrad back in the dark ages uh, where we could actually design our own major. And we could actually develop a theory that we wanted to defend. And my theory was that you could take a grade ape, manipulate its food supply and its environment and prove you would arrive at a human being. Over generations? Over a long period of time. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about this, but... It's an interesting, it's an interesting theory, and and he does have some kind of support for it, so it deserves looking into. But here goes. And so I actually defended my thesis and got an honors, and gave my thesis to my parents and went off to become a very famous heart surgeon and cardiologist. And uh, one of the things I discovered way back then was that we evolve in concert with the plants that we're eating or the animals that we're eating, but back then we were eating leaves. And there's actually... Now, I just want to say something that, you know, he's talking about, the way it sounds to me, he's alluding to the fact that we have gone off to start eating animals where chimpanzees are, are plant eaters, and that's not the case. Chimpanzees eat meat. They they actually will eat their own kind. They're meat eaters, eaters as well. I don't know if they're, you know, I wouldn't say they're primarily meat eaters, but they have been observed in actually cannibalism. We now evidence that the thing that makes us human as opposed to a chimpanzee is there's a distinct change in the gut microbiome between when chimps and gorillas evolved off and we evolved out. You can actually tell a human being by their distinctive gut microbiome uh, instead of a chimpanzee, for instance. Mm. We share 98% of all of our genetic material with chimps and gorillas, and yet we're profoundly different. And what makes us profoundly different from them is not our genes, it's actually the genes of our microbiome. Unfortunately, uh, my wife has had some very real experience with just how important the microbiome is. You're the only person I've ever heard talk about that. I'd love to hear more about that. So, um, if we were going to prove your thesis out, and what would we be doing to the diet to create that effect in the microbiome that would express so, such a radically different species? Lectins are plant proteins that are one of the major defense systems of a plant against being eaten. One of the things that's hard for us to con conceptualize is that plants do not want to be eaten. They actually have a life, and they were actually here first. Uh, when insects arrived, plants had a problem because they couldn't run, they couldn't fight, they couldn't hide. But they have a huge advantage, and that's their chemists. Um, they can turn sunlight into matter, and we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So what they do is they make proteins that are sometimes called sticky proteins or lectins that stick to certain sugar molecules in us, particularly in our gut lining. Just by the way, if anybody has sinusitis or runny noses when they eat certain foods, you are actually producing sugar molecules in your mucus to trap lectins. And I have so many people who had chronic... Now, I, I just want to kick into this and make a mention about mucus. 
And what is the source of mucus? Our body could create mucus? I don't think so. Our, our body does not create the mucus that he's discussing that traps these sugar molecules and does these things to help us. And, and the mucus is a byproduct of the bacteria that is bound in these membranes and it resides there and it knows if something's going to come in here to bother it. Like these molecules that he's talking about, these toxins and different, different assaulting molecules, they will produce excessive mucus. Exactly what you see. And they do it not necessarily to protect us, but to protect themselves possibly. I don't know. Maybe they're doing it for both reasons. Maybe they're doing it just to, for self-preservation. No clue. But I know that, that is the result of these inhabitants that live there <laughs> getting assaulted. They fight back. Now, not only that, they are intelligent enough, and I don't care what you say, they are intelligent enough to cooperate with their neighbors and their communal group. These, these are group activities, these enzymes that come out of these bacteria. As far as I know, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, bacteria create a single enzyme, basically. And that enzyme is literally a chemistry set. It's, a, it's a, a set of molecules that does some chemistry. Whatever that is, it might be breaking down things that you have eaten so that your body can absorb them in a very tiny molecular form that only these little tiny bugs can do. And they do it by producing a chemistry set and they send that out away from them not living it's not swimming it's not doing it it's just floating in and amongst everything and it attaches because of its catalyst type of reaction in other words it's a reactive molecule. It's floating around like a little sticky bomb. He's talking about sticky lectins and things. Let's talk about enzymes being sticky, which they are. They have a, a an electronic, and it's, it is electronic, it's an electronic affinity to attach electronically, almost like like the new electronic keys they have in the cars. If you put it in and it doesn't have the right series of electronic things in the right spaces, it'll say, that's not the right key. I, you, you just go away. We don't want you here. But if it says, hey, I know what that guy is, that I am supposed to attach to here, 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 and here, and now I am going to become whatever that molecule is. In a, in a car, it says, I'll, I'll start. But in a, in a molecule, it says, I recognize that thing. And that thing, because it has all of these different plus, minus, plus, minus, and then minus, 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 plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, 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 and it has all of that stuff in all of that sequence. It says, if I see that sequence, it means I have to create an amino acid, or I have to create ammonia, or I am going to be turning something into a sugar molecule, or I am going to create a transition metal. So what is the byproduct of all that speaking to molecules? And that's what they do. They're literally speaking with those different, if it comes like this and everything goes together, it says, I know who you are and I know what you want me to do. If it comes like this, it says, I don't work with you. Go away. If it comes like this, it says, I know who you are. Normally you come in like this, but now that you're like this, it means you want me to create a methane instead of a butane or whatever. That is the way it breaks down in these families because it's a cascade of events. I'm going to try to explain. It's a little tricky when you get into the molecular breakdown of these enzymes, but it's like a handshake. I'm going to get into it and sort of talk about that. I'm getting off a little bit, but the way the bacteria work is they break down molecules you take in into little bitty pieces. 
Then some of them say, hey, now that you got those little pieces, I'm going to bolt this to this and this is a copper to an aluminum to a oxygen and then I'm going to add a nitrogen over here and then I'm going to throw a couple of hydrogens on and then we're going to glue it onto a, a chain of carbons. We're going to send it out through your body and then people are going to pick things off of it or you're going to dump a whole product down here of, of sugar or whatever you're going to do. And that'll happen by them coming up and throwing an electron at you. And if you catch the electron, go with them. Have a nice time. If you don't catch the electron, just keep right on rolling. Now, eventually, where you left, another guy's going to come along. He's probably going to be something that's going to have some carbon attached to it. And, get you, and it's going to get carboxylated out of, you know, decarboxylated and blown out of your lungs. All right, so let's listen to this guy. Didn't mean to get off track too far. Exoinocytis, including myself, when we finally got lectins out of our diet, they completely went away. So lectins bind to sugar molecules. Lectins cause the wall of our gut to actually separate. And people have heard the term leaky gut. I used to, if you'd asked me 15 years ago if I thought leaky gut was a, was a problem, I would have said it was pseudoscience. Now, with the advances in understanding how the mic Wait for this, catch this, and do not miss this. ...microbiome works, and in understanding how lectins work, I think everyone who has a disease has a leaky gut. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And it starts very early and, they, you know, they're fighting against them. You know, everybody's saying, oh, vaccines are safe. And they are. They are. The vaccine part's okay. But the issue that happens is MMR vaccines cause a, an, an enormous quantity of the people that get it to have a gut infection. If you get that gut infection uh, in a little kid, they can have brain seizures and then it starts off with the autism. It goes right, gets just as bad as it can get. You look it up, look up Freedom of Information Act, MMR test results, and you will see that, I, I think it said over 50% had gut infections. Now, that's about as bad as it can get, and these kids are getting autism at the rate, it's just staggering. And, uh, and, and from everything I could find out, it is the gut and bacteria that's causing these issues. You know, I, I mean, I'm not saying do this or do that. I'm just saying I'm, I am a researcher. He's going to talk about researching, and that's the problem. They have, they're, everybody's reading from the same book that somebody told somebody a long time ago. And, and I'm going back to find things that were 20, 30, 40 years ago. They knew this, but they were afraid to talk about it, and it got lost. It just got lost. Now... I'm pretty dumb. Hippocrates said this 2,500 years ago, that all disease begins in the gut. So one of the things we know about research is research is research. Look again, because somebody already knew this, and Hippocrates knew it 2,500 years ago. It's really interesting, and I'm, I, I've heard that quote so many times, and it's one that I just accept and go, oh, wow, what Okay, I, Dr. Gundry there, I do feel that he's primarily correct about what he's saying. It's absolutely the gut back, uh, microbiota. And what I liked about his research was that he's extremely well um, cited. I mean, he's a, he's a top guy, and he is well respected on, I don't know, not so much anymore, I don't think, because of his stance away from traditional medicine. I imagine he's probably suffered from that. I would imagine. I'd like to hear him say he hasn't. Anyway, um, but he's, he's right. The microbiota transfer therapy, which is nothing more than a poop and I mean, he did like 25 years ago or something they were doing it, alters gut ecosystem, improves gastrointestinal autism symptoms. And I've been working, not working, but just talking with people that are in the autistic community and asking them what's going on. And some of them are taking microbiota. I mean, um, it's called um, Primal Defense by, uh, I think it's Garden of Life, something like that. Primal Defense, and they, 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 there's specifically one woman that's been communicating with me, and her son has has had pretty good success 
uh, with this. And he was severely autistic. And she said that some other people are starting to take it, and they're seeing some symptoms uh, subside too. And she she seems very very thrilled. So, you know, all I can say, and she, as a matter of fact, she sent me something today. She says you made a new woman out of me, and I, you know, that that's a pretty good feeling. Uh, you know, to, I've looked at their life in a whole different way after being involved in just asking people about autism. What is it that, like daily? How do you have to? T what What is your daily routine and all that? It's not. It's not something I'd want to do. I can tell you that right now. And if there's a way out of it, we're going to try to find it. All right. Okay, I'm just going to leave it at this. Gastrointestinal issues, schizophrenia, every single thing you can put in there. Follow up by um, digestive disorders and digestive disorders. And it will tell you that that's your symptom based, uh, you know, that's a, a byproduct of your actual condition, which is, I say it's just the opposite. In my world, could be wrong, but I, I, I would love to see have poop enemas um, deregulated just to, you know you could send something into a lab and say is this poop acceptable to do an animal with is there any pathogens in here I have to worry about and they send back and they say no and I can't see why you wouldn't be able to take it out of the freezer or wherever you have it stashed away and uh, use it you know I mean there's got to be some kind of uh, protocols for it but I don't think it's uh, you know splitting any atoms here <laughs> you know I mean this is not I mean it's an animal what, what can I say